On September 18, 1889, an aristocratic young woman moved into a house in the near west side, the neighborhood of Johnny Powers, Prince of the Boodlers, to see if she could help. The work she did would make Jane Addams the most famous woman in America, the most famous woman in the world after Queen Victoria. The press would call her Saint Jane. Adams was born in Cedarville, an Illinois prairie town, the pampered daughter of its wealthiest merchant. She was among the first generation of women to graduate from college. She graduated with energy and enthusiasm and nowhere to expend it. Um, as a young single woman at the time, she was expected to either marry or stay home and become everyone's favorite aunt and take care of the family. And she wanted more from her life. She took two grand tours of Europe, and when she tired of the galleries, she wandered into Whitechapel, a slum in London's East End. There, she found her calling. She goes through an epiphanal experience, a kind of a slap in the face. She writes something like, you know, there were these prostitutes of Whitechapel. This is Jack the Ripper time, right? And he's these 12-year-old, 13-year-old prostitutes, and she says, there but for the grace of God go I. Those people look like little Janie. Uh, so why is, you know, back home we're saying, well, that's those people who do that, those people from Eastern Europe, uh, Southern Europe, uh, black people. But here's a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant prostitute. That could be Jane Addams. So what's the difference between me and that girl? Jane Addams visited Toynbee Hall in the East End, the world's first settlement house established by Oxford graduates. To break down class barriers, they taught art and literature to the poor. In Chicago, she bought the rundown mansion of Charles Hull, now surrounded by a sea of immigrants in the city's worst neighborhood. At age 29, Jane Addams established Hull House, her own settlement house in the near west side. She recruited about 20 upper-class white women and moved in. She decided to move into the community because she'd learned from the boys at Toynbee Hall that the only way to understand poverty was to live the life of poverty, was to move into it. What Jane Addams originally hoped to accomplish sounds quite humble. It was a desire to create mutual social relations between the working class and the steward class or the more blessed members of society. Her belief was that democracy is enhanced if every member of the democracy understands the point of view of other members of the democracy. She began by offering her poor neighbors, as Toynbee Hall had, upper class culture, including classes in Shakespeare. Now imagine this, you know, Shakespeare on the west side, in the middle of the west side. These people are poor, they don't necessarily know where their next meal is coming from, but the crazy lady who opened what looked to be a whorehouse, but it's really something called a southern house, wants them to sit around and have tea and discuss somebody named Shakespeare. I would have loved to have been there for that first meeting of the Shakespeare Club at Hull House. She was attracting a working class population of what I might call strivers who aspired to middle class status. And they did attend these classes because that was an avenue of survival and very popular English classes were taught at Hull House. People were not conscripted to take those classes. People were grateful for an opportunity to have somebody teach them English for free and in a setting in which they were going to be treated with dignity. Adams believed in the refining power of art. Near West Side visitors were treated to reproductions of the European masters. She soon learned her neighbors had more basic needs. We were ready to perform the humblest neighborhood services, she later wrote. We were asked to wash the newborn babies and to prepare the dead for burial to nurse the sick, and to mind the children. Supported by wealthy patrons, Hull House ran a nursery, kindergarten classes, clubs for older children, and night classes for adults. It offered people who could not bathe all winter, public baths, a gymnasium, a swimming pool. 
and the city's first public playground. When a local synagogue could no longer support its orchestra, Russian immigrants brought their 11-year-old son and his clarinet to Hull House. Benny Goodman joined the Hull House band. When Hilda Sapp dropped out of the Jewish training school to sew cuffs in a sweatshop, she took evening classes at Hull House. And one of the courses she took was in creative writing, and the man who taught that course was the secretary to the president of the University of Chicago. Apparently, he was so impressed by what she produced that he arranged for her to get a scholarship to the University of Chicago for one quarter, that's all. But she went from fourth grade to the University of Chicago, which in itself is kind of remarkable, and she placed out of freshman English. I was just astonished at that. Hull House helped Hilda Satt escape the poverty of the near west side. She met a young man who liked the theater, married him, and moved to Wisconsin. Her daughter, Dina, grew up in a working class area in Wisconsin and went to the University of Chicago on a scholarship. Her granddaughter, Suzanne Epstein, got her doctorate at MIT, runs a lab for the Food and Drug Administration, and lives in upscale Bethesda, Maryland. Many of the 9,000 visitors a week that Hull House would come to attract came to hear lectures on the pressing issues of the day. Jane Adams was a great believer in free speech. Hull House had socialists come and talk here, they had anarchists come and talk here, they even had vegetarians come and talk here. So they were open to ideas, they wanted them to be out in the public. Some Hull House projects were more successful than others. Tearing down a tenement to build a playground was not a success. People were really hostile for a reason that nobody in the Sullivan House ever thought about. And it was that by having this tenement torn down, they had in effect reduced the number of apartments available. And what they learned is that a ratty apartment is better than no apartment at all. Another project was to provide ready-made meals for women to take home to their families. Sounds like a great idea. People stayed away in droves. There was a lot of creamed codfish on the menu and mutton stew. No spaghetti, no kielbasa. People in this neighborhood were not interested in Hull House's sort of sanitized version of good food. They also may have offended the sensibilities of the women in this neighborhood. The role of cooking for your family was considered a very primary role for most women. And who were these young women? How dare they try to cook for people's families? So the public kitchen was never much of a success. Jane Addams had more success when she tackled the garbage problem. The alleyways of the near west side were piled high with garbage, infested with maggots. Children were playing with maggots as if they were little pets. And she recognized that this was tremendously dangerous for the health of the community. There was diphtheria in this community. There was typhoid in this community. There was a, a high death rate of children below the age of five. The ward bosses just didn't care about such things. They didn't care about health measures. The positions were uh, political patronage positions. The people in charge of getting rid of the garbage were not interested in their task and the ward bosses were interested in the patronage, not in the cleaning of, uh, of garbage. Jane Adams tried to unseat Johnny Powers as alderman and lost. He could get his voters jobs. She could not. She did get herself appointed the ward's garbage inspector at $1,000 a year, the only paying job she ever had. Jane Adams got up every morning at the crack of dawn and followed the garbage wagons through this neighborhood garbage was put into wooden boxes that were basically nailed to the wooden sidewalks and so it wasn't simply a, a matter of sort of picking up the box and throwing it into the back of a wagon you had to shovel this garbage out now if you were a political patronage appointee chances are you didn't feel much incentive to dig too deep into the garbage boxes and she made sure they hit bottom Florence Kelly a socialist firebrand changed the agenda of Hull House. 
she convinced Jane Addams the poor would be better served by social change, not tea parties. Kelly is urging her to get out of Hull House. Instead of having people come to Hull House, you've got to go into the neighborhoods and you, you've got to expose first because if people have to know how horrid conditions are and how extensive these horrific conditions are in the city. And the only way we can do that is publicity. And we have to do it with hard statistics. This is the age of science and statistics and the beginnings of social science. So she urged these social science techniques of surveying and map making and in this way alert a nation and try to prick the conscience of a nation. When Hull House finished its elaborate survey of the near west side, it had a hard time finding a publisher who could handle the 14 color codes that identified each ethnic group crammed in its tenements. A vast number of families, it found, had incomes of five dollars or less a week. The first systematic study of a working class neighborhood in America. The survey brought fame to Hull House. It called attention to the near west side, but little changed. Kelly wrote a searing report on sweatshops, which led to an Illinois law for an eight hour day for women and children, and banned child labor under 14. She was appointed Illinois' first factory inspector. Some parents bribed employers to hire their children, who provided one-third of their income. Although the Illinois Supreme Court overruled the factory labor law as an infringement on property rights, it would become in future decades a model of a new liberalism. Before this period of time, reform was associated with uh, getting uh, corrupt politicians from the uh, lower classes out of office and putting the quote-unquote best men in their place. Now you began to get a new kind of reform, which is much more closely associated with uh, modern liberalism of the 20th century variety. In fact, this period of time is, is really the birth of that whole approach. The winter after the fair closed, arsonists burned the remains of a decaying white city. It seemed to symbolize the illusion of the urban ideal. To Ida B. Wells, Chicago's problems were overshadowed by possibilities. She found a haven she could not have found in the South for her campaign for civil rights. She remained after the fair. In coming decades, black Americans would follow her, migrating from the South by the tens of thousands in search of work. They came because they saw in Chicago not problems, they saw opportunity. Like the Irish, Germans, Scandinavians, Bohemians, Poles, Russians, Jews, and Lithuanians before them and the Yankee speculators before them, and the French explorers who first saw the potential of the stinging river by the portage. There's more about Chicago on American Experience Online. Take a Chicago trivia challenge, spend a day in the life of Jane Addams, and visit the Midway at the World's Fair. All this and more at PBS Online, pbs.org, America Online Keyword, PBS.
American experience is made possible by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The Foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. Liberty Mutual Insurance is a proud supporter of the American experience. And by helping people live safer, more secure lives, we're also proud supporters of the American dream. At the Scotts Company, we help make gardens more beautiful, lawns greener, trees taller. If there's a better business to be in, please let us know. Major funding for Chicago City of the Century, provided by the Rauner Family Foundation, supporting the education and well-being of children in Chicago. And by the state of Illinois. Discover, indulge, explore, play. Right here, right now in Illinois. American Experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. For more information on this topic, you can order the companion book, Chicago, City of the Century, by Donald L. Miller for $16.95 plus shipping and handling. Please call 1-800-255-9424.